I wonder, have you ever felt like you were in a fog? You know, like maybe it's a cold medicine fog. Maybe it's a literal fog like I was in. I actually took this picture uh, on Friday morning with my friend, that's Freddie Ginther there in the front of the canoe as we were uh, boating at sunrise um, to a place where we were going deer hunting and we couldn't see a thing. And we were going to a place where we've never been, you know? And it's like, that picture's really neat, you know? And I've got more that are really cool. They make for great photos. But the problem is that a yacht could be anywhere, like, you know, a barge, like just, we had no idea what was coming around the bend, right? We had no idea where we we're going. In fact, if you could chart our course, it was all over the lake that morning until we found our way to the spot we were trying to get to. You've experienced this. When you're in a fog, literally, visibility is limited. Objects are present, but details are fuzzy. It's easy to miss a turn. It's hard to know what's coming at you or what's going on all around you. I bring this up because about 10 years ago, as we were praying for this new church that had yet to come up out of the ground, we were praying for the people to whom we were being called, and some of our core team, as we were praying, began to sense that the Spirit of God was giving us a picture in our minds of of who He was calling us to be and, and the place where He was calling us to go. As we were praying, someone in our group saw a picture of this area, the Chattanooga, Ottawa, Cleveland, this whole kind of area. You know, this area that's always in the race for those crazy lists, like most churched city, you know, and uh, most biblically minded city in America. Chattanooga flirts with those lists all the time. There's lots of churches in this area. There's a lot of religious activity in this area. There are a lot of conservative moral values in this area. But in this picture that we sense the Lord giving us, this city was in a fog, like a religious haze. In this picture, the haze was a combination of big questions about faith, broken relationships, confusing circumstances. But in the midst of those things, also all the church-related activity and all the religious rituals and motions without real clarity or purpose. And most importantly, in this haze was a lack of vibrancy and a real dynamic relationship with God without the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. When you become a member here, you share your story of faith with us. And let me read to you a portion of someone's story. You wrote, I grew up going to church. In elementary school, I prayed to receive Christ and professed my faith in him. Unfortunately, for many years, I lived like there was little more to following Jesus. All there was to do was try to sin as little as possible, conceal whatever sin was present in my life so as not to disappoint God or my family, and then just hold on for heaven someday. I wonder if anyone can relate to that. I got to tell you, as I was rereading that story this week, I got frustrated. That should upset us. This is the fog. There's nothing more to the Christian life than just trying harder not to sin so that you don't disappoint God or anyone else. Maybe come to church a few times, say some prayers, and just hang on for heaven. That's the fog. But the good news is there is more. There is more. And Jesus has something to say to us about that today. He can lead us out of the religious fog into something deeper and richer and so much more satisfying. Two weeks ago, we looked at a specific message that Jesus had for the first century church in Ephesus. We looked at that message out of the book of Revelation It's a message that we believe is relevant for us individually and as a church right now in this very specific season we're in. If you remember, the church in Ephesus had lost that love and feeling. Jesus actually said to them in Revelation 2 verse 4, I have this against you. 
that you have abandoned the love you had at first. In other words, in the midst of all of their religious activity, their passion for Jesus had waned. Their compassion for the lost and the hurting in their city around them had waned. Their dependence on the Holy Spirit had waned. And so Jesus gives them a strong warning. He says, if you don't remember from where you'd fallen in verse 5, if you don't repent and then begin to redo the works that you did at first, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. We said that was a picture of God's presence with them, empowering their witness and their influence in the world. I wonder, have you ever been to a church where it just seemed dead? Like something's missing. Like they talk about God, like he's this historical figure who did all these amazing things a long time ago, but in the present moment, he seems to have vacated the building. May that never be said of Two Rivers Church. You know what I often hear about our church? It's not, oh man, the preaching's awesome. It's not the concert-like worship atmosphere or the light show. I mean, if there's a light show here, it's because something's wrong, right? Like, almost all the time. It's not the awesome building. We don't have one. It's not the perfectly designed kid spaces. We turn the classrooms into those spaces. It's, I feel welcome here. It's, I feel the warmth here. There's something here. We would say there's someone here. Praise God for that. But I tell you, what else I long to hear more of is I met God here. Or maybe in a very real way, I sense the presence of God in this place and in these people. You know, when that person is singing up there, leading us in worship, I believe her. Like she believes what she's saying. The people around me with their hands raised, that guy over there on his knees, this is real to them. When the greeter welcomes me, there's this genuine love When someone asks me how I'm doing, I think they actually want to hear how I'm doing. When I'm telling someone about a big thing I've got going on, they say, can I pray for you? And then they say, like, right now, like, in the middle of the lobby, can I pray for you? I long to hear them say, when I'm here, God speaks to me. Because we believe. It's a core conviction that we were founded upon. That we live in response to God. And what that means is that God is active and speaking and directing our lives every single moment. And our role is simply to respond to what he's saying. But when our love for Jesus begins to fade, when our hatred for falsehood and unorthodox beliefs becomes hatred of the people who hold those beliefs, when we no longer listen to and obey the Holy Spirit in real time in our lives, our light begins to dim. And we lose our witness to the world around us. Jesus told the Ephesians they'd lost the love they had at first and they need to remember what it was like at the beginning. So today, for just a few moments, let's go back to where it started in Ephesus when the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit first came to town. If you have a Bible... I invite you to turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. This is is the birth of the church at Ephesus. It's right here around 52, 53 AD. And I'm going to begin reading in Acts 18 verse 24. If you don't have a Bible, you don't pull it up on your phone, it'll be on the screen for you to follow along. Acts 18, 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside, and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. So when a church begins, 
it's usually because someone is doing what the Lord has told them to do. So in the case of Two Rivers Church, that was Chris and Katie Jessen and a handful of others being obedient to what God had told them. Here, in the case of Ephesus, it's a guy named Apollos who was from Alexandria in Egypt. There was a large Jewish community there in Alexandria. There was a famous Jewish library where people from around the world would come to study about the Jewish God of history. And it's possible that there in Alexandria, there was a sect of Jews who had followed John the Baptist in Palestine, who had then traveled to Alexandria and began to, to, to spread the word about John the Baptist and his ministry and the one who was to come, the one named Jesus. That's probably how Apollos had been taught about Jesus. But he only knew the baptism of John. Now, what does that mean? Well, baptism, as we saw last week right here in front of us, represents the death of an old life and the rising to a new life. For the Jews, being baptized by John the Baptist, if you remember reading about that in the Gospels, it was about burying their old, apathetic way of not really paying attention to the Torah, you know, not really following the law. And then they were rising to a new life in which they were really going to try more to obey the law and they were anticipating or preparing for the coming of the Messiah. So apparently Apollos is teaching that Jesus is the Messiah. He knows that much. John had explained that. But he's teaching Jews they need to get baptized so they can try harder again. He might not have even known or fully understood about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He might not have known what had happened with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So while he was in the synagogue preaching, Priscilla and Aquila, who were a, a missionary couple, they'd been traveling with the Apostle Paul, they hear Apollo's teaching, and they're like, something's not quite right. Like, something's just a little bit off. So they pull him aside, and they start explaining the gospel more fully to him. And then in Acts 18, it kind of ends there with Apollos feeling led by God to travel to Corinth, tell more people about this this gospel that he's been even more informed about now. And as he goes to Corinth, the Apostle Paul arrives in Ephesus. In Acts 19.1, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples, probably some disciples of Apollos. This was like maybe even pre-Priscilla and Aquila, before they got a hold of him and straightened him out, right? So Paul is talking to these guys, and He realizes something's off, so he asks them a pretty important question in verse 2. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed in Jesus? And they said, the Holy who? (laughs) Like, no, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. (laughs) You know, Apollos had taught what he knew, and he was faithful with it, but he had missed something pretty significant. And I wonder, how many of you grew up hearing about Jesus, knowing he died for your sins, but had little understanding or experience with the person of the Holy Spirit and his ability to empower you. Paul said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. Now, this is what Luke records as a part of the conversation. I imagine it took a little bit longer than this. Like, perhaps Paul's smiling here to them and saying, guys, you might want to sit down because this is going to blow your mind. And then perhaps he began to walk them back. Maybe he went to Exodus, and he showed where, hey, guys, you remember back in the law and the Torah in Exodus when God would meet with Moses and talk to him like he was talking with a friend while the rest of the people would stand at their tents and watch but never be able to go in to meet with God? You remember that? As a side note, I was talking to a couple this week who they're trying to discern the voice of God and the leadership in their life about something pretty significant. And I was asking, you know, not just telling them what they ought to do, but asking, what do you, what do you sense the Lord is doing and saying to you? And and, uh, and my friend, my sister, you know, began to, to say, well, you know, I've been, she actually used this phrase. She was like, I've been talking to God more 
about this. And I've just been trying to just strike up a conversation with him like I would talk to a friend. Perhaps Paul takes them to this place and talks about God speaking to Moses like this. And then he begins to point to the prophecy of Joel and the prophets when God speaks of a day when he would pour out his spirit on all people and there would no longer just be one representative who heard from God, but all his people would see visions and dream dreams and they would hear from him. And then perhaps the Apostle Paul then told them about what happened on the day of Pentecost, right there at the beginning of the book of Acts, that the prophecy of Joel was now fulfilled. And on and on Paul could have gone talking about what God had been doing through the power of the Holy Spirit and how ordinary people were now living extraordinary lives as they listen and obey God's Spirit within them. And then in Acts 19 verse 5, upon hearing all of this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus having heard all of this. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. When Paul prayed for these guys, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, there was evidence of this manifestation of God's nearness. This this very, the manifestation would be like making it apparent and real and near and tangible. Much like at Pentecost, God was marking this moment. He was showing himself in a whole new way. And these guys' lives were forever changed. Prior to this, it was just religion. Earnestly trying to be good enough for God. But the gospel that we preach here, the the gospel is that God is making us pure and then filling us with his spirit and empowering us to live in obedience to him. And when I say obedience... I don't just mean be good moral people. The Spirit of God comes to transform our hearts and motives and shape us into the character of Jesus, yes, but he also comes to empower us for ministry. This is why the Holy Spirit would be such an important theme in Paul's letter to the Ephesians later on. He would write that about 10 years after the birth of the church in Ephesus. And here we are, about 10 years later, after that picture, talking about this. In Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, Paul writes that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means that anyone who believes in Jesus, you're given a seal. You now belong to him. Jesus stamps you at his, as his own. Then in Ephesians 2, 22, Paul writes that we are a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The same Spirit who lived in Jesus when he was here on earth lives in us. In Ephesians 3, 16, Paul prays that we would be strengthened with power his, through his Spirit in our inner beings. And then in Ephesians 5, 18, we're given a command regarding the gift of God's Spirit. Paul writes... Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Although we are sealed with the Spirit who comes to live in us, he may not be filling us. The verb here means that we are to be completely filled, to let this sealing work of the Spirit, this indwelling work of the Spirit have its full impact on our lives. It's being filled with the spirit that makes it possible to live every life-giving command that we find in God's word. It's what makes it possible to join God in what he's doing all around us. It's what brings vibrancy and power to our Christian lives. If you've been reading Acts with us over the last several weeks, you've seen the same groups and the same individuals being filled with the spirit over and over again. At Pentecost, 120 disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. Right after that, Peter and John meet a crippled man at the temple and they are filled again with the Holy Spirit, which enabled them to bring healing to this man. Then the church comes under persecution. So they they all meet together for prayer and they're all filled again. Then Stephen is chosen because he's obviously filled with the Holy Spirit and he later is filled again to give a powerful sermon right before he's killed. 
Peter goes to the Roman soldier Cornelius and he preaches the gospel to the Gentiles there. And then Peter and all those who were there in that moment were again filled with the Spirit. And on and on and on the list goes. This filling doesn't just happen once. And it's not just a second blessing. The filling is too dynamic a reality for any once and for all experience. God is continually filling us with his spirit again and again as we move forward and continue to grow in our discipleship to Jesus. Here in Ephesians, Paul's saying we are to be continually filled with the spirit. And we, we get this idea that we are to be being filled through the, we got to get a little nerdy here for just a moment, okay? We got we to gotta get a little Greek grammar going on here. We got to parse this verb. Paul's using the present tense when he says to be filled, which in Greek means it's a continual action. Paul's saying, keep being filled. This is in the imperative mood. It means that it is a command. We are commanded to keep being filled with the Spirit. But it's also in the passive voice, which means it's done to you. It's not something you can do on your own. The active voice of the verb would be, I fill. The passive voice says, I am filled. I wonder if you caught that. The most essential factor for living the Christian life is something we can't make happen. But we're commanded to do it. I think Paul puts it in the passive voice because he wants to help us see how utterly dependent upon God we are. We can't fill ourselves. We can't control this. We have no control over the Holy Spirit. We can't manipulate him through religious activity or carefully planned programs or rituals or magic prayers. And yet it is a command, which begs me to ask the question, well, what do we do then? What's our role? And part of this is found in the first part of Paul's instruction. Ephesians 5.18, he says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul's not being a prude here. He's not trying to be a teetotaler here. He's just being real. The people were abusing wine. Ephesus was a hotbed for ritualistic cultic behavior, all centered around the Greek goddess Artemis. Her temple was famous for ritual drunkenness. The people in Ephesus had kind of gotten sucked into this, and it was really, it was a part of their lives before the gospel came to them. They were thinking they could find the fullness of life or maybe an escape from the difficulties of life through wine. Just as in our day, we use wine. And also food. And also work. And also entertainment. And also religion. Paul's saying, don't get drunk with wine because something fundamental to our wholeness and our joy is at stake. And this is it. What we seek to fill us will control us. Clearly, that's the case with alcohol. But sneakier with some of the other things, right? Like what we seek to fill the emptiness gets a hold of us and begins to drive us. What we seek to ease emotional pain. What we look to for a little boost to keep us going or provide relief relief to boredom. It slowly but surely begins to master us. Too much over drinking is just an example could be too much overeating, too much overworking, too much streaming or texting or shopping or caffeine. It eventually leads to what Paul calls asotia. That's the word translated debauchery, or in some translations, dissipation. We might say wasted, and we wouldn't be far from that meaning. It's actually the same word that's used in Luke 15, 13, when Jesus is telling the story of the prodigal son, and he says that the younger son gathered all he had, he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in asotos, which is like an adverbial form of asotia, reckless living. He wasted his inheritance. Asotia has the the root sozo, it's the word for salvation, it means to save. When you put an A in front of that, ah, 
sozo, asotia, it creates this negative, describing a state of being unable to save or unable to have saving qualities. In other words, you're not participating in the saving work of God in your life or in others. Paul's saying, don't get drunk with wine because you won't be accessible to the influence and the touch and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. When you get drunk, you're numbed to the influence of the Holy Spirit, right? But again, it's not just alcohol or other substances. Asotia, maybe it's busyness, stress, distraction. You wake up every morning and you already have your agenda. You're no longer stopping to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you as you walk into the grocery store or as you walk down the street where your neighbors are out in their yard. When you walk into the office tomorrow, To be asotia is to be tuned out to the Spirit in control of your own life, living life on your own, unaware, not listening to the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. So part of our role in continually being filled with the Spirit is don't be filled with this other stuff. But it's still a passive thing, right? We we can't control this, which means the other part of our role is simply this. Let me put it in the form of a picture. It's to open up to being filled. It's to yield our spirit and our will to his. It's a desire to be filled with the spirit. It's asking him, would you fill me? It's to confess anything that we're aware of that's in the way of that filling. To confess our fear right? That we we might be taken to places we don't want to go if we're filled with the Spirit. Would God ask me to pour out all my alcohol? Would he ask me to give up my grudge against my spouse and trust that he's working in me? Would he ask me to walk across the street and tell my friend about Jesus? Have an awkward conversation? Would he ask me why I don't trust him with my finances? Would he ask me to step out of my comfort zone and join a life group? What will God ask me if I completely yield to him? That's a real fear. But the Christian life is more than try to be a good person. It's more than just enjoy the benefits of a like-minded community. It's more than just you won't go to hell when you die. You will be taken to new places when he fills you with his spirit. And I wonder, do you want that? Do you want to live a life of vibrancy and passion for Jesus that sees him do mighty things in your life that pours gas on the fire in your heart and burns off that foggy haze. Jesus said in John chapter seven, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John tells us that Jesus was talking about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. I imagine him Perhaps thinking of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, which says of a future day with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The spirit of God. Ready to be poured out. To fill us up. So what? Well, let's go back to that picture of those hands and that water. Perhaps the Lord is calling us to stop wasting our time and our energy and our resources seeking to be filled by anything that will limit the access of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God is saying, be filled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the very breath of God the very power of God. Be filled with the Spirit. 
dump out what's in your hands. That you're trying to fill your life with. That is starting to control your life and numb you out to the very presence and work of God. Confess your need for the Spirit to fill you. Confess your fear of surrendering. And be filled. That's my prayer for us. And I wonder, what is God saying to you? Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I just want to pray in this moment. I know we don't have time. And we're going to get up from here. And for some of us, it's going to feel like like an escape. I pray that we couldn't outrun (laughs) what your spirit wants to do in our hearts. Because I know that it's for our good and our joy. It's for your glory. You want to invite us into something so much more. So would you be speaking to us? And would you make it really clear? Would you turn up the volume of your voice to get over all the things that we've filled our lives with? And would you begin to point those things out that are perhaps kind of keeping our hands closed where we cannot be filled with your spirit? And would you give us the courage to lay those things down so that you can fill us up. And then teach us how to walk with all of these things in our lives in an appropriate way. Where we don't seek to fill our lives with these things. But instead we yield to your spirit surrender to your will. God, I'm praying that you would make us a people so full of you. It's the, the, the streams of living water are just flowing out of us. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That it would wash over our marriages and, and strengthen them, restore them. It would wash over our children as we point them to Jesus. It would wash over our relationships with our our neighbors and our co-workers and those we sit with in the stands as we watch our children play and cheer and dance. Lord God, would you use us? And may this be a place full of power. May this be a church full of power. Your power joining you in what you're doing, shining brightly for the world around us, for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? I said I was going to pray for the mission team, but I also need you to go get your kids. So I'm going to pray for the mission team at the end of the next service you're here on that team, I'll pray for you then and we'll commission you. But I want to commission all of us now. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come and drink. May you drink with joy from the wells of salvation this week and don't let anything else substitute for that. God bless you. Have a great week.